is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. It's the end of the month, so it's time to share some updates. I'd like to start today with the story of Wilma Acosta. Three weeks ago, the night of November 25th into the 26th, just after Thanksgiving, Wilma went out with some friends and she has not been seen since. I will be doing an episode very soon with members of her family with more details, but for now, we want to get all of the information out we can in the hopes that someone who saw something can help them. This information is what I've collected from talking to family members and other community members. It is not official or from public statements, so the information might change, but this is what is known now. Wilma moved to Portland in September from California. She was happy to start her job at Kaiser and was doing well. Going out, she found a home away from home at Dixie's Tavern at 3rd and Cooch in Old Town, downtown Portland. Friends from California were with her on the weekend of the 26th, and they all went to Dixie's. For those unfamiliar with Portland, Old Town is located on the west side in downtown Portland. If you come into the city via the Burnside Bridge, it's on the right. In my late 20s and early 30s, Old Town was where myself and friends went for a night out. We had our favorite karaoke place, but there were, before COVID, a lot of bars in a very close proximity. It is still the home of Darcells and CC Slaughters, our drag bar and one of my favorite gay bars. There are a couple of strip clubs and other establishments. There are apartments above most of the businesses, a police station, several resource facilities for houseless folks, including housing. And there's the halfway house where Richard Gilmore, the serial rapist, was assigned. Old Town Pizza is known for its ghost stories and the Shanghai tunnels, tunnels that have been rumored to have been used to carry out unconscious loggers or sailors to be kidnapped and used on boats. Tourist stop Voodoo Donut is just across Burnside. The Max, our public transportation train, passes through the neighborhood as well. Because of the bar scene in the area, during the day, there tends to be not a ton of people, some going to work, some going home, some houseless folks, a lot of whom are struggling with addiction. Then on the weekends, you have folks that are coming down to party and enjoy the closed-off streets. The area has a lot of personalities and dynamics. Around 1.30 a.m. on Sunday the 26th, her friends left. Wilma walked with them outside, giving them the keys to her apartment, which was less than two miles away, just across the steel bridge on the east side of Portland. As they waited for an Uber, Wilma went back to the bar. It's believed she told them that she would catch an Uber to get home. Around this time, Wilma asked the bartender at Dixie's for an application. She wanted to work there for extra income and fun. I did speak to that bartender unofficially, and they were not aware of who I was, so this was just casual conversation. But they did remember seeing Wilma and had seen her several times before. They did not ask her to wait until after closing to get the application. Wilma was given the application, and they made plans for her to come back the following weekend. After her friends left, Wilma went back to the bar and returned to a group of what is believed to have been four men who she and her friends had been hanging out with throughout the night. One of those things where your group commingles with another group and you become one big group. I have been told that one of the men in that group of men had one of Wilma's friends on alert. The man was texting all night. He wasn't drinking. Something just seemed off. He gave the friend such a bad vibe that he actually took a video of him. So we'll see about getting that information out. These guys are not suspects. They just happen to have been some of the last people to be seen with her so they could speak to her state of mind or anything that they saw that might have been questionable. The bar closed at 2 a.m. Wilma left on her own. There have been comments that those men followed her, but the bar was closing, so everyone was kind of following everyone. The family has seen the security footage from Dixie's. Wilma can be seen walking toward NATO, which is three blocks east, toward the Willamette River. When she gets to the street that she would have taken to go home, she turns one way and it appears that she was either confused about direction, again, she's only lived here a couple months and she'd been out partying, or she saw someone or something that she did not want to interact with. 
She turns in the other direction and heads toward home again. She crosses NATO, and because of the camera quality, the distance, and the lack of lighting, she disappears into the shadows. The friends called Wilma's parents the following morning to let them know that she did not come home. Her phone was recovered later in the day on the 26th, right at the waterfront, which is at the water. There's a wide sidewalk for bikes and pedestrians, and then a long parkway of greenery. There are several houseless camps in the area with a lot of people, and her phone was found just feet from the furthest northern end of the Saturday market. On Friday, December 15th, a candlelight vigil was held across the street from Dixie's. Her parents and brother have been in town to search, spread the word, hand out flyers, and hold vigils, and they were interviewed by KATU, our local ABC affiliate. The group spoke with a lot of houseless folks in the area who were very kind and helpful. Many were quite concerned because they know just how dangerous the Old Town area can be. From my experience going out on Thanksgiving nights, you didn't really see local people or the local houseless community out because they knew a lot of people were coming home for the holidays or you had a lot of tourists and then everyone was going to go out to party and it made for a lot of noise. And people that hung out in that area normally wouldn't be there on a Saturday, which a few people did confirm that, yep, they usually dip at that time. The owners of Dixie's came out and they spoke with Wilma's parents. They brought everyone water and hand warmers. They offered cocoa, coffee, and bathrooms to anyone who needed it. Some police were pulling away, so I actually stopped to ask them about Wilma. They said that they don't ever get told anything, and families don't either. The detectives, quote, keep things close to the chest. They also told everyone, you're doing the right thing, the squeaky wheel. On Saturday the 16th, the family met at the water where the phone was located. Flyers were handed out, and the Springwater Corridor was checked over by Selwood. The family questioned houseless folks if they had seen or heard anything about Wilma. I checked with vendors at the market. Unfortunately, those closest to where Wilma had been didn't have any additional security measures in place, just the camera used by the market itself. Wilma's family is living in her apartment, praying all day every day for her safe return. They don't know when they'll be going back home because investigators have left them in the dark. It wasn't until just a few days ago that they were finally assigned a detective, the same in charge of some of the cases related to the possible serial killer, Jesse Calhoun. The cops were right about one thing. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. They have even told Wilma's family how surprised they are by their persistence. So let's get to squeaking. I never say never. I've read too many stories of things happening to people that you had never thought it would happen to. However, I do find it very hard to believe that someone who just moved, loved their job, just got a puppy, had friends in town waiting at home for her, and 20 minutes prior excitedly asked for a job application, then walked over and jumped into the river. I also find it odd that someone would only leave a phone, not phone and jewelry or their purse or some sort of note or sending a text. She had plans to go to SantaCon on the 16th. She had plans to travel out of the country. Because of all the stories I've covered, in my gut, it feels like this was maybe something of opportunity. Perhaps a predator, maybe from the bar, maybe just walking in the area, saw a 28-year-old woman walking toward the bridge by herself, and that was that. She could have had her phone in her hand when something happened, hence the location. Again, that's totally my speculation, but that's my biggest fear and worry. Even if that isn't the case, and she did harm herself, Wilma still deserves to be found, and her family deserves to be given answers. All the detective needs to do to help the family know what direction to go in is to get the video from the bridge. Then they'll know to search for perpetrators or to search the water. She was alone or she wasn't. That one piece of film was what Wilma's mother prayed for at the waterfront. She called out to God, asking, Sir, please show us the video, and spoke with love as she begged him to guide her. She called out to Wilma for her to show them where she is, to be led to her. The love this family has for each other and for Wilma is palpable, and they deserve answers. Wilma was last seen in Old Town, leaving Dixie's around 2.20 a.m. on Sunday, November 26th. She is an indigenous woman with brown eyes and black shoulder-length hair. She is 5 foot 5 and 150 pounds. She has several tattoos, including a spiral on her right elbow, a creature on her left inner forearm, an X on her right knee, a deer on her left, lettering on her knuckles and neck. She has a scar on her right eyebrow. That night, she was wearing an Apple watch, boots, jeans, a lace top, and black coat. 
Everyone who has seen her photos or knew her in person has remarked on her noticeable beauty. Maybe you were at Dixie's that night, or you're a regular. Maybe you saw someone unusual, or you even know the names of those guys that she was with. Anything helps. So please call in any tips you have. This family is aching for Wilma to come home safely. If you have any information about Wilma, please call 503-823-0097, or you can call 911. I do have an update within the update. After writing this all out on Saturday, I received an email from someone in the media I had contacted about the vigils. They had shared the information about the two gatherings, which the Portland Police Bureau caught wind of. Public Information Manager Mike Benner sent that person this press release. It has been almost three weeks since Wilma Acosta disappeared. We can only imagine the grief her family and friends are experiencing. Our heart aches alongside theirs. The Portland Police Bureau's Missing Persons Unit has been dogged in its approach to determining what happened to Wilma. Our detectives have spent more than 100 hours interviewing witnesses and examining footage from more than a dozen security cameras. The video shows Wilma leaving the Dixie's Tavern by herself and walking to the seawall that borders the Willamette River. This is where Wilma's cell phone was located. During her walk, it does not appear that Wilma engaged with any other people. Ultimately, PPB's evidence shows Wilma leaving the bar by herself and arriving at the seawall by herself. PPB detectives do not suspect foul play in Wilma's disappearance. We hope Wilma's family and friends are able to find closure soon. I can't help but notice a few things in that statement. One, it was being sent around the same time that a detective was telling the family that they were investigating her disappearance, but they think that Wilma was sad. When I asked the police who were in the area, they did look her up and she was still in the system as a missing person. The statement doesn't say that they saw Wilma go into the water, just that she got to the seawall. Does that mean they received the video from the bridges? If so, why have they not shown it to the family? It also doesn't say that they have closed the case, just that they want the family to find closure. It's alarming, concerning, and odd to say the least. In doing the math, 100 hours would be one person working a regular eight-hour shift for five days a week for the three weeks since she disappeared. So that sounds like a big number, but it is the literal least it should be. The family should be allowed to see those videos and get the confirmation they need so they can seek that closure that PPB is so concerned with them finding. A side note of how much of an epidemic this is, on the Friday night we were out, one of the women taking part in the vigil was there as her own sister had gone missing a year ago in California. And while the vigil was taking place, another group of searchers stopped us to ask about their missing person. I actually have another update. This is the most recent available information as of the evening of Monday, December 18th. On the 18th, the family met at Portland City Hall. The commissioner's office has given them space to use for rest and to hold meetings. They offer them printing of flyers and other helpful things. I want to share some of the more important and shocking information that came from that meeting. On Sunday, December 17th, two boats went out, along with Wilma's dad, to check the Willamette River. The sonar went wide and deep. Approximately 30 feet from the seawall, 50 feet upriver toward the steel bridge, and 15 feet down, a figure was spotted. For the experts on board, they were concerned right away that it was a body. All of the sonars on the two boats picked up on the same object. Police were informed of this discovery. They went out with a boat on the 18th. They claimed to not find that shape and only saw logs. They did not bring a dive team. When Wilma was leaving the bar, she called a friend back home. This appeared to be that thing that so many of us ladies have done when walking to our car or walking home and realizing it's dark and perhaps scary to be out, so we want to ease those fears by talking with a friend. That friend said that Wilma did not sound upset. As they spoke, she said, I think I messed up. This could have possibly been about directions. He then heard footsteps, some music, perhaps from a passing car or walking past a bar. Then the phone abruptly cut off. He called back, but did not get an answer. The police never interviewed Wilma's new boyfriend. After meeting on Halloween, they had been spending time together and making plans. They were supposed to meet up on Sunday morning after Wilma's night out with friends. He called to make sure they were still on, but the police answered. They never followed up with an interview or questioning. He, along with Wilma's co-workers, all said she was happy and that nothing seemed off. 
If Wilma had ever sounded distraught, depressed, or suicidal, her mother said a family member would have been by her side immediately. But Wilma never implied that she was struggling in any way. The police have tried to say that she was taking medication or had even been hospitalized. But there is no record of that, and her parents found no medication in her home. For the family, there would have been no shame in struggling. They know everyone has good days and bad. Wilma's mother was so proud and happy for Wilma because she was achieving her dreams and reaching her goals. Wilma had a dream of moving to Portland. She went to school to become a phlebotomist. She was ecstatic when she got her dream job at Kaiser so that she could move up here. She had always wanted a Jeep and recently got one. She was super happy with her job, and she even recently got a puppy. She also had future plans. She was supposed to go on vacation out of the country. She and the new boyfriend were planning on going to Santa Crawl on the 16th. Near the train tracks under the steel bridge, a facility with Homeland Security cameras was found by the family. They told the family they not only had cameras, but they were wide and even had night vision. The police never sought footage from them. The police also told the family that Dixie's Tavern did not have any security footage. When the family went to the bar, they not only had footage, but they learned the police didn't have it because they had not been there yet. Speaking of Dixie's, some of the footage from inside shows the following. At one point, a man was dancing on Wilma against her will, so she had to physically push him away. Later, another man, possibly from that group of four that she had been hanging out with, grabbed her jacket. They got into sort of a tug of war before he walked away with the jacket, but she does appear to get it back before she left. In that footage, it was unclear if that interaction was aggressive or flirtatious. Some of the footage from a surveillance camera on Cooch shows two men on the other side of the street. As Wilma enters the frame, one of the men crosses the street and he changes his pace so he can walk right in front of Wilma. Once in front of her, while she's on the phone, he looks over his shoulder at her several times. They are quickly out of the camera's frame. The men were carrying pizza, so they may have come from Old Town Pizza or Dante's. It is concerning to say the least. It would be nice to know who these men were just to see if they knew anything. It also contradicts the police statement saying that she was alone. She wasn't walking with these men, but she certainly wasn't by herself. The family worries that when she turned the corner, she saw the other man, which was why she changed directions. As her mother watches the video, she can't help but yell out to her daughter. The visual of that man in front of her seconds before she was last seen will haunt her for the rest of her life. And the family wants to make it clear they do not hold any hatred for the police. They want a positive relationship with them because they need them. But when the information is so unclear, they feel lost. What they can't understand is why every statement the police have made has been so easily contradicted. In response to the police statement, the family asked me to share the following questions. Why haven't the police opened Wilma's phone or tried to trace her smartwatch? A video was going to be shown that was supposed to give answers. Police told the family that they would not show it because it could go against what they've said. Why can't they see it? Why did the press release say that they had checked 12 cameras? The family has asked everyone in the area, and they only came up with four videos. Where are these other eight coming from? Why are the police saying that she took her life by jumping into the water, but they won't take a dive team out to check and see if that image from the sonar is a body? She either jumped and is there, or she didn't and isn't. If she isn't in the water, the cameras should show who took her. And finally, why is it always taking so long to get a response from police? The police keep saying that because there is no video footage of a crime being committed, they aren't treating Wilma's disappearance as such. To which the family said, If I came out of my house and found my car was stolen, would they tell me that it wasn't because I didn't have it on film? If they have footage of Wilma harming herself, the family needs to know, and that would show that there wasn't a crime. So my question is, without any footage proving that Wilma harmed herself or that she was harmed or taken by another person, how can they come to that conclusion? The family asks that you share Wilma's story far and wide. Her brother even brought up Gabby Petito. Why was it when she went missing, the world stopped? Why was it a national news story? The room knew the number one reason, which is that Wilma is not white. The family has a lot going against them. They are searching a city that they are not familiar with. Their loved one is indigenous. It's the holidays, so people are traveling and taking time off. Even the news isn't tackling big stories. 
They need a community to help them find their daughter. So please share, share, share. All right, time for a call to action. First, please join the Searching for Wilma Acosta group on Facebook. There you will find updated information, events, and how you can help. Just having more people share her flyer on social media will be of big help. If you can, please give to their GoFundMe. The family does not know how they're going to pay for their daughter's rent, have a rental car, or other expenses when their lives are in California. If you have a connection for a car, like a rental or a discount, or a reliable loaner even for a few weeks, anything would help. Given what the family has seen on the sonar, they are desperate to get a dive team out to the water. So if you know of divers who are skilled at recovery in rivers, please reach out. You can contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com and we can get it to the family, or you could post it in the Facebook group. Because of a lack of communication and confusing information, the family would like to hire a private investigator, another reason to donate to the GoFundMe. So if you know of a good private eye, please post that information as well. The family is also looking to get legal representation. The police say they are still, three weeks later, waiting for video from nearby bridges. The family has several surveillance videos. You can see that it is Wilma in the videos, but they aren't the best quality. So if you are an expert at enhancing or know someone, again, please contact us or you can post it on the group. More than anything, the family needs and wants community. Without the authorities helping, it falls on the people. They hope that at the very least, Wilma's disappearance will bring people together and create a network of people so that when this happens again to another person, they won't feel as alone as they have. So that is what's available right now about Wilma. The family is still going out, posting flyers. They're all over the waterfront. Her mother just wants to know what direction to go in. She just kept saying, I never thought I'd be here. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this because it's not something anyone knows until they're in it. So that's the story of Wilma. It's just really important for everyone to keep sharing her name. The cops were right. The more we squeak, the more annoying we're going to be and the more willing they'll be to give some answers or show the video. That's what I don't get. The mom was begging God, begging in a prayer, please just show me that video. Get that video to the police. And in this day and age, it seems really inexcusable. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, why, and the more eyes on it, the easier it is to spot her. Like, why, yeah. why wouldn't you? Why is it I could stand there at the waterfront and do a live Instagram and do a two-minute video that uploaded no problem, but this footage from a bridge is taking three weeks? Because they have to request it from the city, I'm guessing. Oh, I'm sure there's a ton of red tape, but that's why the mom was just saying, just tell me which direction yeah. to go. Was Did something happen that no one recognized? It's really hard to square, you know, get a job application, have a puppy, have this new job. You seem really excited and great. Something could have happened. I get that. Or was she intoxicated and didn't see and it was dark and she fell into the water? How do you not just say, here's what we saw? Because they yeah. did not say in that release, and we saw her fall into the water. They said, we saw her get to the seawall, which is exactly what the family saw because they said it gets so dark the camera is so far away, you just see her figure until it goes into the shadows and you can't see. So we just got to keep the word out, really bug these people and hope that they get some answers. I mentioned in one of our last update episodes that we were waiting on information on Cameron Hooker, the subject of our episode 2,640 days. This is from back in November well, this is no surprise, but the date was pushed out again. Cameron Hooker, the kidnapper of Colleen Stan in 1977, who held her captive in a box under his bed for seven years, has yet to have a day in court, as we were expecting. He was eventually convicted in 1985 for multiple counts, including kidnapping, oral copulation, rape with a foreign object, sodomy, and six counts of rape. He was originally sentenced to 104 years for his crimes, but after California passed a state law that would allow elderly prisoners to be eligible for earlier paroles, his sentence was reduced to 74 years, making him eligible for parole in 2015 if he met other criteria. Now, he was denied previously, but his sentence is officially deemed complete, and now the only thing keeping him from parole is the designation of violent predator, 
which will need to be decided in court. Cameron was supposed to go to court earlier this year for a hearing that would decide if he should be designated a sexually violent predator, which would halt any ability to be paroled. The hearing was supposed to be in early 2023, but there were a number of delays due to COVID. The hearing was then moved to the end of November and expected to have some kind of answer after those delays. However, his defense team requested a delay and they were granted that delay. And they're still seeking an expert for his case for a proper evaluation. So that's why it was granted. Interesting. Yeah. So now we have to wait until March 9th, 2024 for his hearing. But I wouldn't be surprised if it gets delayed again, honestly. The good news with the delays is that at least he's still in prison. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's a plus. Like, but the bad news it. is Colleen Stan usually has to go to these things. Oh, gosh. she has. She's the reason he's a violent predator. You know what I mean? Right. So without her, like, what if one day she's just like had enough? Um, and, and you know how I feel about having to rely on victims yes. to keep people from getting parole. It's mm-hmm. very annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, but alas, here we are. Mm. Well, that'll be interesting. Why can't they just roll old footage at those meetings? Be like, yeah. here's, here's yeah. what she said the last five years. Yes. She signs off that she has the exact same things to say. We can just speed this process up. and You know, there probably is something for that. Like somebody can speak on her behalf maybe. But, you know, she feels strongly about keeping him behind bars. So I think she's going to be involved until she is totally, he dies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, honestly. How old is he? Oh, gosh, I can't quite remember. Late se- late 70s, I think. Something so. like oh, that. Good. He, he okay. never fulfilled okay. that 74 years, if that's yeah. what you're wondering. <laughs> but, you know, there's all sorts of loopholes to get through a, a sentence, the concurrency and all that. Well, for her sake, I hope it doesn't get bumped then. I agree. He just stays where he is and it's... And I believe he's in a mental health prison yeah. facility. Mm-hmm. So it's, I mean, it's a better situation than than the federal prison he was in. But yeah, for him, at least. Josh, you have an update. Well, it's time for Corrections Corner. Seems, uh, well, we got an email from a listener, Sabrina B., who said I uh, pronounced the name of a town incorrectly. Bum, bum, bum. And I'm I'm furious at myself (laughs) and Sabrina B. for pointing out my mistakes. So for my episode... Uh, the order part two, I was talking about, I don't remember, I think the order members were switching out cars or something in New Mexico. And the name of the town that I mispronounced is spelled B-E-L-E-N. I pronounced it Bellin, and I believe it's Balin. Right? There you Ballin. go. Balin. Balin, New Mexico. Thanks for uh, making me admit my failures. <laughs> It's his favorite thing to do. Mm-hmm. It's all mm-hmm. of our favorite things. <laughs> I wasn't to crying earlier. His failures, not ours. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for stopping by Corrections Corner. <laughs> That's all for today. <laughs> well, this isn't Corrections Corner, but Josh needs to acknowledge the recent deaths with suspicious timing. Moments after Josh released his episode about the white supremacists and their hit list, two of the biggest names on it passed away. One was the beloved American television icon Norman Lear. The other was celebrated because he died war criminal Henry Kissinger. And at the same time, I mentioned Ryan O'Neill on an episode of Always Be My Sisters, our Golden Girls podcast, which was the same week he died. So we're either cursed or wizards. Josh, what do you have to say for yourself? I like to think I'm more like that boy in that old speaking of Twilight Zone episodes where the uh, he can wish people into a cornfield or turn them into a <laughs> wicked toy and I can kill Kissingers with my mind. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah. It's a weird coincidence. And I thought it, I found it. I It's kind of bothers me. Yeah. And uh, I miss Norman Lear. He was a beautiful <laughs> little elf man. Yeah. And a genius. He had good energy. Henry Kissinger, cool glasses. Bad guy. Shithead. (laughs) In other news, on Black Friday, a day specifically chosen for the representation, an inmate in the Federal Correctional Institution in Tucson, Arizona, took it upon himself to give former police officer and current inmate for murder, Derek Chauvin, a little early Christmas present. John Strange Tursak 
has since been charged with attempted murder. The former gang leader and FBI informant and member of the Mexican Mafia prison gang shanked the killer of George Floyd 22 times. He claims he did not want to kill him so much as make a statement via the victim and the date, Black Friday correlating to Black Lives Matter and the black hand that represents his gang. Derek was fine and is back in prison to finish his consecutive 20 or so years for violating George Floyd's civil rights and for second-degree murder. Johnny Strange was going to be released after serving oh. almost all of his 30-year sentence in 2026. Wow. That probably won't be happening now. Well, he, I will say, you know, despite how you feel on this, he's lucky he didn't die because he would... I mean, where where is this? California? Where is uh, it? Arizona. Arizona. Do they have death penalty? I because... don't know, but that's not a place to mess with for getting in trouble. Well, for if, sure. yeah, if you kill someone after already being in prison for killing someone, many states make you eligible for death row. Yeah. Like death row after that. So. Yeah. Wow. That's like he really put his own life to the side for what he believes in. Mm -hmm. That's kind of impressive. Yeah. And it, he's got an interesting story. I, I was reading more and more of it. And basically he was in I think the Mexican mafia gang outside of prison and he kind of led a faction of it, which led to the FBI getting involved. And then he committed a lot of crimes, but was trying to say, well, hey, you told me to do what I needed to do to get you the info. Mm -hmm. One of those things. So it's pretty interesting and also interesting. Yeah. So close to being done. Yeah. He's like, nah, I'm good. I'll stay here a little well, while. Some people sabotage their own ability to leave prison because they don't want to. Oh, yeah. He's been there since the 90s. Yeah. I'm sure there's some running trepidation shit. about, oh, yeah, you're a top dog and I don't want to go back into the real world. And have to either go back into crime life or try to get it together and start all over. It's hard. That's a hard decision for yeah. many, many people. Did it say where he was stabbed on his body? I did not see that anywhere. I mean, I just Hopefully pictured... that ugly face. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I that pictured, was really harsh. Well, no, he sucks and is. I pictured just a classic shanking yeah, probably to the, the I just, side. I'm just and, wondering how he survived that. Yeah, and I would think it was probably a fairly Shallow. small weapon. That's what I yeah. Was, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, though, how did he get so much time to do 22? Like, were the guards in on it? Girl, that shit happens fast. It's like you get one spot and you and just, just go. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah. The holiday season is known for two things, merriment and stress. Get the kids covered for their days off of school. Get them to their holiday parties or performances. Get presents for your loved ones. Get the decorations up. Pick up groceries, traffic, dinners, work, life. It can be a lot. A natural option for relieving stress, anxiety, restlessness, and other sleep-related symptoms is CBD. Yet not all CBDs are equal or work the same. Because of testing, quality, and efficiency, my new go-to CBD is Next Evo. I've used a lot of different brands and forms of CBD, and nothing has tasted as good, worked as well, or had such a positive effect on my stress and anxiety than Next Evo. If my day starts with feelings of anxiousness or stress, I enjoy three Next Evo gelatin-free stress complex gummies. Soon after, I feel like a weight has been lifted. I'm not impaired in any way, it's just that that little voice of anxiety has chilled out. Next Evo tests their products, unlike so many other CBD brands, so you'll actually get an accurate dose. My favorite part about Next Evo, besides how well it works and how good I feel, is the variety of options. Need help in the sleep department? Try their sleep support complex. Need something while on the go? Use one of the tiny CBD powder packs that fit discreetly in your purse or pocket and are perfect for those times when you need a little relief in your day. I took one just last week once I realized I was going to be stuck in traffic. It made the ride home much less stressful. Sleep better and calm your stress. Upgrade to better natural solutions from Next Evo Naturals. Go to nextevo.com and use the promo code RAIN for 25% off. That is 25% off at nextevo.com using the promo code RAIN. Next Evo. Join the evolution. Meal planning is great in theory, but for my brain, it is a real struggle. What makes planning ahead even more difficult is the stress of the holidays. On top of that, it's hard to get anything done when you're hungry. That's why we love America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, Factor. 
Imagine all of the fresh food and nutritional benefits you want from a meal delivery service, but in ready to heat and eat never frozen meals. When you or your family members start to get hangry, deciding what to eat, prepping it all out, cooking it, and finally getting around to eating can take forever. And then you have to clean up, but not with Factor. Factor meals are not your run of the mill packaged meals. You can choose from Factor's weekly menu via your preferences of keto, vegetarian, chef's choice, protein plus, and more. Factor covers every meal, so you could start your day with some gingerbread seasoned pancakes, have a peanut Buddha bowl for lunch, and wrap up the day with a stuffed pepper casserole. They even offer gourmet plus options like leeks, truffles, and broccolini. So if you're looking for all of the convenience of a food delivery service without the inconvenience of cooking, look no further than Factor. In just two minutes, you can be enjoying a fresh, delicious meal and know that you are making a sustainable choice as 100% of their emissions are offset and they use 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices. Head to factormeals.com rain50 and use the code rain50 to get 50% off. That's code rain50 at factormeals.com slash rain50 to get 50% off. Factor, healthy eating made easy. And now an update about the officers on trial for the death of Manny Ellis, which I did an episode of Unknown Trouble, and we did an update, I believe, in November. So the trial is still going on, and here's what's been happening in the last couple weeks. Officer Matthew Collins took the stand in his own defense. He said, quote, Anything that someone would say to us until they're complying with us with hands behind their back would be irrelevant to me. He also claimed he never heard Manny say he couldn't breathe. The prosecution countered that by playing an audio recording of the incident where Manny begged for relief so he could breathe and Officer Collins responding with, shut the fuck up. (gasps) Presented with the evidence, Collins said that it was him on the recording because Officer Burbank, his former partner and now co-defendant, doesn't swear. He agreed that he had said that, but he continued to claim he only heard animal noises from Manny. So he's basically saying he heard him making noise, but did not hear him say that. Exactly. Or in the height of the crisis, he was only concerned with getting handcuffs on him. I just have a hard time buying that because of the way he sounded when he was saying it. And also, you are the one with training. Even when someone is losing it, you are supposed to be able to step back and process the information. And And why is it they're always screaming, shut the fuck up at these people? Uh Uh-huh. They're not calm when they're doing this. You think at some point when... Yeah, exactly. You think at some point with someone saying they can't breathe, you'd be like, oh, you know what? Maybe that's the truth. Because these or people even that if keep it saying isn't, this die. Even if it isn't, you can restrain someone without mm-hmm. choking them out. You certainly can. As for his thoughts on the trial and Manny's death, Officer Collins said, quote, For police officers, it's the worst thing that can happen. In this case, undoubtedly, Manny was in the wrong, but at the end of the day, his mother lost a child, his sister lost a brother. I didn't think in my wildest nightmares that the state would come after us for this. The come after us, meaning charging them for murdering a man. The state then asked for a mistrial, which upset the defense. Rankin was being cross-examined by the state, and he had three days to talk with people before his official interview. The state said, you had counsel, but both sides said that they wouldn't speak about other legal representation. It got really messy, and it led to an hour-long discussion and attempted defense mistrial, which was dismissed. The state's closing arguments didn't help quell objections from the defense. Patty Eakes, the state's special prosecutor, said, Mr. Ellis didn't need to die that day. If only he had been granted the dignity of being human and being responded to. The defense argued that that statement made the cops sound like bigots. And there had been discussion before the trial about using language that lessened anyone's humanity so animal noises and uh, if he had been granted the dignity of being a human that was the main issue judge kershoff responded saying i don't want to dismiss this case because this community needs to hear from a jury about this not a judge deliberations began on thursday december 14th and now here we are december 17th and i don't know if they meet on weekends i know i would want to to be like can we go home So now we are still waiting to hear the outcome. Hopefully in the next couple days we will hear. And once we do, we will post about it and definitely have it for our next update. And what she said was very pertinent and Mm -hmm. that hits home. But it seems silly to me that they would. 
I don't know, not not let her use that language. Like, that's silly. Well, yeah, it had been on both sides where it was. I get it. Not like, gonna, like there were special parameters, as there are with every trial. And it was specific about anything lessening his humanity. But it's also you're saying he has, was making animal noises and you wouldn't bother acknowledging him. So yeah, that all they on did you guys. it to themselves. Exactly. So it'll be interesting to see the outcome. There's a lot of different ways this could go. Just to remind me, were these the cops in that unit, like a special unit? Was it the Scorpions? Yeah. Was it yeah, wasn't I, I, it that case? No. So Manny Ellis was up in Seattle or Tacoma, I believe. And that's the Scorpion one. Uh, no, that was Tyree Nichols, oh. which was in Memphis. Oh, he, that was yeah, the okay. Scorpion unit, and those guys have been disbanded, and they've got their own legal things going on. Manny Ellis was up in Tacoma walking home. He may have been using, I can't remember what his toxicology was, but he was in rehab. He had just left church playing the piano or drums stopped by a convenience store and was a couple blocks from home and the cops just pulled over and then tackled oh, them. Oh, I do remember that. Yeah. And, the, and he was then, wearing headphones. And, yeah, yeah. And the yeah. cars were waiting and they were filming yeah. and then they were like, well, we don't know what to do. We'll go. It's hard to keep them all straight. There's so goddamn many of them. There are so many and they're so similar. Yeah. You know, it's mm-hmm. the hood, the spit hood and the pressure and the neck and the the and arms. The, and the, I can't the breathe. Delirium I can't breathe. Yeah. The, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's unknown trouble, I believe, part two, if you want to refresher for Manny's case. But uh, like I said, next update will hopefully ha- will at least have the outcome from the from the case and maybe even sentencing. So this one is less of an update and more of an addendum to an older episode. In February of 2021, we aired the episode Hearts and Death. And in that episode, I told the story of what happened to Tara Lee McCarthy and her unborn child. Tara was just 19 years old when her longtime boyfriend, Delmer Joseph Anholt Jr., brutally murdered her. The pair spent Valentine's Day in 1982 hitchhiking from Portland to the coast. They were dropped off in Scapoos, Oregon, where they were waiting out the rain and trying to find another ride. Later that night, a state trooper stumbled upon their backpacks, which sat unattended in the dark. As he looked around the area, he heard mumbling and flashed his light up and found a man hovering over the body of a woman who was covered in blood. Ann Holt had done unimaginable things to his girlfriend, including multiple stab wounds and some of the most gruesome sexual trauma we've ever talked about on the show. In that episode, we also talked about how hard it was to find documentation on this case and that we were pretty sure he was in prison. We just couldn't find a record of him in Oregon. Now, since that episode aired, Several people have reached out after listening, saying they were able to locate him. And we never really mentioned it in the episode, and I didn't even update the blog. So we're doing that today. Delmer Anholt is, in fact, still in prison. There were some spelling discrepancies from how his name was originally published when he committed the crimes to how it is actually spelled on his prisoner record. So rather than um, D-E-L-M-A-R, it's actually D-E-L-M-E-R. So the blog has been updated with his Department of Corrections information. And spoiler alert, he doesn't have a release date. He's he's a lifer. That's good news. Yes. I remember that. If you listen to that episode, it is gruesome. Yeah, I definitely remember that one for sure. That's good news. And I'm glad I appreciate that person, that listener that wrote it. Yeah. And she's not the first. We had some Instagram comments a long time ago. And I just think, you know, life was crazy and I didn't update the blog. But yeah. I'm glad someone else brought it and up. And that's definitely not the first time either that one little letter is different for whatever reason. Yeah. And oh, there's their entire story. Yeah. <laughs> it's frustrating. So I've got a story about some remains that were identified that because the headline said remains identified of Oregon woman, I assumed, meant Oregon. I mean, as one would. Because you shouldn't name cities after states, and you certainly shouldn't put that city in a headline. (laughs) Because then someone might think it's Oregon the state. (laughs) Who would that be? Well, I would like to tell you this story, and just FYI, it's not from Oregon the state. (laughs) I think it counts. I think so as well, and also it's important to get her story out. Connie Christensen was only 20 years old in 1982, For reasons not yet known to the public, Connie left her one-year-old daughter, Misty, with family members as she made her way from Oregon, Wisconsin, to Tennessee. The last sighting of her was in early April of that year in Nashville. Yes, she was from Wisconsin, but an area known as Oregon. Hence why it took me a really long time to realize it was not the right state. But we're going to share her story. 
Connie had a scheduled return to Wisconsin and her daughter, but she did not come back when expected. That was when her family reported her missing. Eight months later, in December, hunters in Jacksonburg, Indiana, which is an hour east of Indianapolis, discovered the remains of a woman. Calling it in, investigators found the woman had been shot. She was also wearing high-heeled clogs, a long-sleeved blouse, slacks, and a jacket. There was also a gold ring with diamonds and an opal, and it was said that she was about 14 weeks pregnant. Unable to identify the remains, they were stored at the University of Indianapolis's Forensic Anthropology Department in hopes that DNA would advance and they could be identified. Never giving up on Connie, her family worked on ancestry to not only build an accurate tree, but several of them uploaded their DNA. Because of that, the DNA Doe Project was able to test the DNA against what they had pulled from the body. It was a close match to two of Connie's family members. With that, it was confirmed the body recovered was that of 20-year-old, four-month pregnant Connie. The police gave her daughter Misty the gold, diamond, and opal ring. They also took her to the woods so she could lay flowers at the location where she had been recovered. As we know, homicide is the number one killer of pregnant women. I'm not sure what the statistics were for the 80s, but I'm sure it was still a rampant issue. There is no information about possible suspects, the father to that pregnancy, or the investigation. We can only hope that by confirming it was Connie and that she was murdered, there will be justice for her and her family. That's some great news after all of those years waiting to finally have a, an actual identification instead of hoping or assuming. So. Yeah, and yet again, building ancestry helps yeah. with these DNA matches. Mm -hmm. Something that you may have heard us talking about in some of our older episodes is that we have a great relationship with our local CBS affiliate, Coin News. Each week we have a short segment called True Crime Tuesday on their morning show, AM Extra, where we get to highlight a case, whether it's a missing person, a wanted criminal, or an unsolved case. We thought it would be good to surface a few of these cases to our broader listeners because you never know if you have information that could help crack a case. On October 21st, 2023, around 4.30 a.m., 34-year-old Brandon Coleman was walking near the Morrison Bridge on-ramp at NATO Parkway. As he did, a vehicle struck him and did not stop. Brandon had been in the area at that time as recent developments in his mental health led to him choosing to live on the streets. Those who loved him don't care about his housing or mental health status. He was someone they cared for. He was someone who loved to make others laugh and listen to music. Without any witnesses, vehicle description, or suspected drivers, Brandon's family is desperate for answers as to who killed him. His father, Ron, hopes that by sharing information, someone will come forward. He hopes someone will give a tip about a damaged car or other clues as to who killed his son. Brandon had people who loved him. For them, he did not deserve to die like this, and they don't deserve to not have justice. If you have any information about the hit and run that took Brandon Coleman's life on October 21st, 2023, you are asked to email crimetips at police.portlandoregon.gov. You can reference case number 23275661. While Maria Negrete and her boyfriend were driving down Southwest Hall Boulevard in Tigard, Oregon on Monday, September 18, 2023, she accidentally dropped her phone out of the car window. Her boyfriend pulled over and stopped so that he could retrieve it. This was around 9 p.m. Though Maria's boyfriend exited the car to get the phone, Maria followed him out and she was struck by a vehicle. The car did not stop after hitting her. Maria was taken to the hospital for her injuries, but succumbed to them two days later. She was the mother of five children, two of which are underage and have to deal with not only the loss of their mother, but being placed with a new guardian. Someone was behind the wheel that night and knows what they did. Perhaps you have a friend or neighbor whose car suffered damage mid-September of 2023. The family just wants to know what happened and to get closure. You can help Maria's family by donating to their GoFundMe, just search Maria Negrete, N-E-G-R-E-T-E. -E. And if you have any information about who struck and killed Maria, you're asked to call the Tigard Police Department at 503-718-2677, or you can leave a tip at crimestoppersoforegon.com. There's a $2,500 reward for tips that lead to an arrest. 
January 17th will mark the 30th anniversary of the multiple murders that took place at what was Gresham Leathers Oil. That night, a former and disgruntled employee, Tyrone Thies, made an unexpected return. After being accused of theft, Tyrone had been fired a few months prior. Angered, he sought revenge, bringing his cousin Larry Scherf and Larry's girlfriend Lori Stevens with him. The plan was for Larry and Lori to wait in the car as Tyrone robbed the station. Sadly, the robbery went wrong as Tyrone forced three female employees, Mary Beth Wheeler, 25, her mother-in-law, Rosalie Fay Gertz, 51, and their co-worker, Virginia K. Endicott, who was 47, into the garage portion of the building. Once there, Tyrone forced them to lay on the ground face down. After doing so, he walked past each of them, shooting them in the back of their heads. All three women died at the scene in what has been called Gresham's most gruesome murders. For those of you who are local or know the Portland area, this is out towards Powell and Palmquist, way deep in Gresham on the east side heading towards the mountain. I believe it's now a shell station. Larry, Lori, and Tyrone left in the car. Soon after, Larry and Lori were caught. Before authorities could arrest Tyrone, he disappeared. Now, 30 years later, justice is still being sought. Tyrone has been on the run since February of 1994. He was featured on both America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, but the killer of Mary Beth, Rose, and Virginia is still on the loose. At the time of these heinous crimes, Tyrone was six foot four and 180 pounds. With a long face and long body, he has a somewhat distinctive look. He also has a tattoo of a panther crawling up his stomach. He would now be 50 years old. If you have any information about this case or know the whereabouts of Tyrone Thies, please call the Gresham Police at 503-618-2719 or the Oregon Crime Stoppers at 503-823-4357. We hope everyone has a safe, happy, and healthy holiday season and a wonderful new year. We know this isn't always the easiest time of year, so if you are in need of support or just need someone to talk to, you can call or text 988 at any time. If you call or text 24-7, someone will be on the other end and can help you out. And I know someone who's used that in recent years. That's great. And they said they came to the realization a few minutes into the call that they felt like they didn't need it. And that's the point. Exactly. Don't feel stupid. Just do it. It is those moments where you feel like you don't know what to do, that things can happen. And even if you feel silly to call or you're scared to call or you don't want to call, even if it takes one second to go, oh, okay, I just need to be grounded. I just need to. And those people in their darkest moments, they don't realize that that moment could be in front of them. Yeah. Until they get to it. Yeah. So you got like having someone to talk it through till you get to that point. Mm -hmm. That's all that that's all that you need. Yeah. It is nothing to be ashamed of. It is there to help. You don't have to be on the cusp of anything. It's not just to call if you're concerned about self-harm. It's any kind of mental health support. So use it. That's why it's there. All right. Anybody got anything else? That's a no. Happy updates. Happy 2024. Let old acquaintances. Oh, it's the last show of the year. Almost. We've got a couple more shows of the year, but since it's updated, it fits better. Does anyone have a highlight from the year? What's your highlight from the year? My epic vacation. That's pretty good. Getting back on the market. Yeah. <laughs> Proud of you for that. Uh, you said that uh, Alicia said she would marry me on my birthday. Oh, oh yeah. Barfarama. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> we haven't told people officially. I guess we can now. That's an update. Good update. We're getting married in October. That's That's right. Right back. Yeah. And I'm the unofficial maid of honor. She's my hair and makeup <laughs> of honor. My please help me of honor. <laughs> and I'm going to get a killer dress. <laughs> yeah, she's going to look amazing. It's gonna you be better not time. look any better than me, <laughs> <Yeah>. Bridezilla. <laughs> I knew this you'd be a Bridezilla. My day. <laughs> she rips my extensions out of my head. Do they have Groomzilla? No, but they You should. can make it happen. They're, they're about to. <laughs> I, I will film it on your wedding day. I'm going to tear that hotel a new one. That's oh. right. Careful. Yeah, that is a highlight on Josh's birthday. He officially put a ring on it, even though we already had everything planned. <laughs> that was the highlight for sure. And I would say Crime Con was a highlight. Oh, yeah, that was Austin so fun. was great also, but there was something about, I don't know, it just felt really 
exciting. And we met so many amazing people. And we got to have that time together with the three of us. And that was great. And so. I got to meet Derek from Big Brother. And we hung out with Derek. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was a good year. And we're excited for 2024. We got some stuff coming up. We're going to a True Crime Paranormal Podcast Festival in Denver. Denver. We're hopefully going to CrimeCon in Nashville. We've got the True Crime Fest Northwest, which is officially launch- launching very soon. Not through us, but it will be out and about. All right. Happy New Year's. Happy holidays. We'll see everybody soon. Bye. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production written, hosted, and edited by Josh McCullough, Emily Rowney, and Alicia Holland. Feel free to email us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. For as little as a dollar a month, you can subscribe on Patreon to get exclusive access to ad-free and older episodes. For only $5, you can access Patreon-exclusive episodes and content. For more of us, be sure to follow on all the socials, listen to Josh and Alicia on their other show, Always Be My Sisters, and follow Emily on TikTok at M underscore Murder in the Rain. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>